Come one, come all. Welcome to the third tier of the unhinged fallout iceberg. This officially marks the halfway point. As such, we're moving away from some of the more standard things you might see on a fallout iceberg, and are discussing some things that might be controversial, bizarre, or straight up just out there, man. I will admit the last two icebergs were quite New Vegas heavy. For the exact breakdown of this iceberg, there are 8 entries related to the classic Fallout games, Fallout 1 and 2, there are 4 entries related to Fallout 3, 3 related to New Vegas, 7-ish related to Fallout 4, and I guess 2 related to Fallout 76. There you go, that's a rough breakdown and preview. With all that being said, let's get into it, shall we? This is Tier 3 of the Unhinged Fallout Iceberg. Original Child Killer Reputation Art Let's start this iceberg off with a bang. I've sort of avoided speaking on this topic on my channel because it never really sat well with me. Anyway, like always, I'll do my best to be as tactful as possible. Like New Vegas and 76, the classic Fallout games 1 and 2 had a reputation system. Based on actions that the Vault Dweller or Chosen One perform, they can either gain positive or negative reputation. Unique to these games are something called reputation titles. These titles provide benefits and penalties to the character and are achieved by performing a certain feat. Like perks, these titles had an associated Vault Boy icon accompanied with them. For example, in Fallout 2, if you join a new Reno crime family and have an intelligence score greater than 4, you get the reputation title Made Man. Being a made man increases your popularity in New Reno, access to free services while in New Reno, and a few other perks. For the negatives, the three other families hate you, and chem dealers and bartenders charge you more money. In Fallout 1 and 2, there existed a reputation title called Child Killer. You'd get this by killing a child. It came with no benefits, instead you would receive a minus 30 point debuff for initial reactions with both good and evil NPCs. You'd also be subject to a new bounty hunter random encounter. These bounty hunters would scale with your level and could even be encountered wearing power armor and wielding miniguns. Now, like I said previously, each reputation title came with an associated Vault Boy icon. In Fallout 2 initially, the icon, drawn by Brian Menz, was going to be a cheery Vault Boy kicking a pregnant woman in the stomach. For the final release, this icon was cut, and instead the art for the hated reputation took its place. Once upon a time, the image could be found on Brian's DeviantArt account. With the image came a short description. It read, this image was unused and the only Vault Boy image to ever be cut from Fallout 2. I'm sure you can figure out why. I remember when I got the request to do a perk illustration for Child Killer that there would be no way to keep it from being offensive. I mean, really, how do you make an illustration of Child Killer and keep it from being offensive? Anyway, for some reason I thought that this was the least offensive way to do it. I have no idea what I was thinking. Even the designer who requested it realized it was a bad idea, so he nixed it. Looking back on it now, I can't believe I drew this. Sure, while the exact drawing isn't the most graphic Vault Boy image in existence, Bloody Mess for example, it certainly is quite distasteful. And honestly, the fact that some people said it was their favorite perk art on my Fallout Q&A way back in the day was jarring as the artwork isn't even for a perk. Some people just like being edgy, I guess. When I do my reputation art Q&A video, then you can reply with the cut art. Please wait until then. This little rant slash spiel leads me to my next entry. No kids in European Fallout. Did you know that initially Fallout 1 was banned in Europe? For context, many European countries are quite strict when it comes to what is allowed in their media, including video games. While usually a ban comes from graphic content or even drug use, Fallout 1 was initially restricted from distribution in many European countries due to the appearance of children in the game. Once developers released a version that removed visible children from the game, they were given the AOK, -okay, and the game was allowed to be released. For Fallout 2, they did the same created the game how they envisioned it, then just made the kids invisible for the European versions. Quests weren't rewritten, kids were just invisible now. This made it so that the children pickpockets that roam around the den could still steal your stuff, but you wouldn't be able to interact with them to get your things back. Invisible pickpockets. Now that's something. Though as restrictions surrounding video games loosened and digital distribution became more commonplace, many versions of the classic games today, even in Europe, will have children in them. Today, it'd be quite hard to get your hands on a physical copy that excludes kids. Just an interesting little fun fact or trivia for you. Now with the last two topics being slightly controversial, I think it's important to note that although Fallout is edgy, has dark humor, and discusses quite a few mature themes, the game is still designed to be as accessible and as marketable as possible. 
The changes to the initial child killer reputation art and the removal of kids in European Fallout achieved two things simultaneously. It made the games less offensive, of course, but it also made the franchise more accessible for someone who has never heard of it. I don't know, that's just my two cents on the matter. Fallout Test Cells In video games, test cells are in-game environments that are used to test various aspects of gameplay. Things like vendors, traps, textures, quests, weather, weapons, NPC logic, environments, what have you. Normally for players, these areas are inaccessible, but if you've got a fancy command prompt and know the secret password, you can get into them just fine and have a look around. By typing COC, meaning center on cell, then inputting the cell's editor ID, you'll be teleported to these testing grounds. I should note that although 76 does have test cells and actually has the most of any of the other games, due to the online nature of the game, you cannot teleport to these. In the past, some players have accessed these areas and account suspensions have been issued for players that have gone out of bounds in-game. No touchy Fallout 76 test cells. Anyway, Fallout 3, New Vegas, and 4 have quite a few test cells themselves. To be honest with you, many of them are quite plain and lack anything of note, but there are a few that I think are neat. Let's take a look at those. In Fallout 3, Test QA Hair M is an empty vault atrium with NPCs showing off every male hairstyle. Test QA Hair F, in a similar room, shows off every female hairstyle, but the women get party hats as well. Happy birthday! Warehouse Traps features a collection of every trap in Fallout 3. That's fun. Raider Time is a test cell from the pit which features 8 raiders standing in a circle. That too, could be fun. In New Vegas, typing COC Test Dance into the console command prompt will teleport you into an empty void. The only thing that inhabits the void? A lone roulette table. Is this heaven? Maybe one of the creepiest things in Fallout New Vegas is V DO NOT DELETE in all caps. It's just a set of dark metal rooms. The sound of something knocking on metal can be heard. Endgame is the room that the player character is teleported to at the end of the game. It's a simple room with one of the walls replaced by the ending slideshow for the game. Teleporting here will cause your game to end. Fallout 4 has the fewest available test cells, but they're also the most interesting, I think. QA Smoke is one that you may have heard of. Other Bethesda games use the same name for test cells too, like Skyrim. The cell features every crafting station, loads of power armor, and containers featuring nearly every item in the game, including quest items. As far as I know, the only item to not appear in QA Smoke is the Your Special book. The last one I'll mention is one that you've likely already seen without even knowing it, and that is Pre-War TV Studio. The cell is nearly identical to the Soul Survivor's pre-war home. In the kitchen sits the newscaster, the same NPC which is found reading the news report about the start of the Great War during the beginning of Fallout 4. Ain't that neat. Sarah Lyon's Death I've mentioned this one on my biggest Fallout Mysteries video, but I think it's worth a shout out on the unhinged iceberg as well. But maybe let's dive a bit deeper into why her death has so many question marks around it. Sarah Lyons was the Brotherhood of Steel's first documented sentinel, and the leader of the Lyons Pride, an elite unit of knight captains and paladins. In Fallout 3, she played a crucial role in taking back control of the Jefferson Memorial and activating Project Purity. In the events following the main story quest and Broken Steel DLC, Sarah's father, Owen Lyons, the leader of the Capital Wasteland Brotherhood, passed away, leaving Sarah to take her father's place as Elder. But this was short-lived as according to a terminal entry documenting Arthur Maxon's rise to Elder on the Pridwin, notes that Sarah passed away in battle shortly after her father. Her passing led to a succession of failed elders, which eventually resulted in Arthur Maxon being appointed as the youngest elder in the history of the Steel. As elder, Arthur Maxon attempted to marry the humanitarian philosophies of Owen Lyons and the more traditional values of the Brotherhood back home in Lost Hills. From the outside, this resulted in a more aggressive Brotherhood, committing to the eradication of impurities along the eastern seaboard. But what is quickly glossed over in the history of Elder Maxon's rise to power is the death of Sarah Lyons. As the Steel's first documented sentinel, one would think that her death would be more significant than just a single throwaway line. And sure, while maybe they've got a shrine erected to both lions back at the Citadel, learning about her death never sat right with me for some reason. Heck, maybe even the entire story of Maxon's rise to Elder has never sat right with me. Let me explain. According to the Maxon Archive Terminal in the Citadel, Arthur Maxon was born in 2267, making him 10 years old at the start of Fallout 3. Now, the Pridwin terminals describe the events of Arthur's rise in chronological order. Owen and Sarah's death is mentioned before Arthur killed two raiders at the age of 12. This means that both lions passed away within two years of the end of Fallout 3. 
The terminal also notes that it was at age 16 that Arthur reunited the Brotherhood and Outcasts and subsequently became Elder. Four years after that, Fallout 4 begins. So the Capital Wasteland Elder tenures can be broken down into this. The first Elder of the Capital Wasteland Brotherhood of Steel was Owen Lyons. His reign lasted from its effective founding in 2254 to his death in 2278. That is a 24 year reign. Next is Sarah Lyons. Her reign would be from the death of her father to her death, which would be no more than two years. Then, according to the Pridwin Terminal, are a numerous number of ineffective leaders. Their combined reign would be at most, like, five years. And then Maxon takes over for four years until the start of Fallout 4. That is absolutely crazy to me. How abysmal at leading are these Brotherhood members that they can't even stick with one and have to resort to a teenager? And that's why I think, bum bum bum, Maxon was just a plant. I believe his appointment to Elder was a way for the Brotherhood back west to reign in control of the Capital Wasteland Brotherhood. Unlike either Lyons, as Arthur is an impressionable teenager of the faction's original founder, it would be easy to manipulate him and steer him in the direction that the Elders in the Lost Hills Bunker desire. This would be doubly important as the High Elders already had first-hand experience of dealing with a rogue Elder in 2282 with the Mojave Brotherhood of Steel's Elder Elijah. So for them, to avoid another situation like that, it would be in their best interest to reel back in some of these wayward detachments. Sure, while the Lions aren't as manic as Elijah, their beliefs do stray from the original Brotherhood values, so much so that the original detachment was fractured with the former paladin Henry Kasdan forming the Outcasts. So what do you do when you secretly want to seize power? Well, why not let Owen Lyons die of old age, and then stage his successor's death to make it seem like she died in battle? Obviously this is just some theory and none of it will ever be confirmed in lore or in game, but it is interesting to think about. The death of Sarah Lyons and the rise of Arthur Maxon does seem a bit odd to me. Does anyone else feel the same way? Wizard of Oz. Here's one that you could potentially use for your next comparative essay in English class. It's not quite an unhinged theory or anything, but more so a deep reference to an old 1900 children's novel. Have you ever played through the New Vegas DLC Old World Blues and thought, hmm, this all feels so familiar. I feel like I've seen this story before. No? Yes? Maybe? Well, you just might have, even without being fully aware of it. The Wizard of Oz is most commonly known as a 1939 film which is based on a kid's book. The tale follows a girl named Dorothy who gets knocked unconscious due to a storm and wakes up in the land of Oz. After being given a pair of ruby slippers, she's commanded by a good witch to follow the yellow brick road and seek out the malevolent and powerful Wizard of Oz who can help her return home. Along the way, she meets a scarecrow who wants a brain, a tin man who wants a heart, and a lion who wants courage. After some shenanigans, the group eventually are granted an audience with the Wizard of Oz. Although he appears as a giant ghastly head on a screen, behind the curtains, literally, it's just a normal man. The normal dude gives tokens to Dorothy's travelers which signify the things which they desire, showing them that they always had a brain, heart, and courage. Dorothy then discovers that if she taps her heels together three times and repeats there's no place like home, she'll return back to Kansas. And that is essentially the cliff notes for the Wizard of Oz. You're welcome. Who says we don't learn anything meaningful around here? Anyway, Old World Blues' main quest is quite similar to the Wizard of Oz. The courier is knocked out and finds themselves stuck in a strange and mysterious land, that being the big empty. They want to go home, but they don't have the means to. They spend much of their time looking for their brain, heart, and spine, having no spine or backbone being a common phrase for someone who is cowardly or who lacks courage. This is all similar to what Dorothy's companions are looking for. Dr. Morbius is initially portrayed as a malevolent and even evil being, but ends up being misunderstood, similar to the Wizard of Oz himself. He even has a dialogue option referencing the Wizard of Oz, though he may have forgotten bits of it over time. As a little bonus, the Big Mountain Transportal Ponder is similar to the Ruby Slippers, allowing the main character to travel back home. The Wizard of Oz, or the Scientist of the Big Empty. One sounds a bit better than the other, that's for sure. Intelligent Raccoons Hear me out, this is the last one for intelligent animals. I swear. Maybe. Cut from Fallout 1 were a group of FEV mutated raccoons. The only remnants from the group that remain in the game come from the FEV experiment disc found at the Glow. The entry dated January 12th, 2076 reads, With batch 11-011, we have improved the mitotic cell efficiency by 43%. We have infected 53 raccoons with the new strain. In addition to the now expected size increase, 
behavioral tests confirmed an increase in intelligence and manual dexterity by 19 points on the Schuler Cap Index. Unfortunately, several subjects escaped confinement and had to be hunted down and dispatched. Major Barnett ordered the remaining subjects to be terminated. Two pairs were unaccounted for. According to Follett Bible No. 7, the four raccoons that managed to escape the West Tech facility roamed northwest until they discovered a small overgrown oasis. The group settled the area and became skilled hunters and named themselves the Eslanter, meaning kindred. The group then managed to learn English from a series of texts that they had taken with them when they abandoned their testing grounds. With their hunting skills, lush home named burrows, and intelligence, the Eslanter now had their own share of the wasteland. But great things don't last forever. Curiosity of the Eslanter caused some to venture from burrows. It was in 2106 that they discovered a small band of humans. Upon seeing the bipedal raccoons, the humans fired upon them. Only a few survived and made it back to their community. It was upon news of human hostility that the Eslanter experienced their first great divide. Half the tribe wished to defend themselves from humans and burrowed underground, creating a network known as the Dens, and resorted to more animalistic ways. The other half remained in burrows, content with technology and surface life. While the population was divided, the group refrained from any internal conflict, at least for a while. The next major event would come 24 years later during the Great Winter of 2130. The group was struggling during the winter and despair set in. Realizing that the tribe needed hope, its new leader, Minishin, founded the Religion of the Glow. Minishin claimed that the gods that created them and helped them survive hard times lived in the Glow. As Minishin's father was one of the four Eslanter that came from the Glow, his followers believed him. When Minishin eventually passed years later, the truth that the Religion of the Glow was made up died with him. By 2161, near the start of the first followed, a group of Eslanter traveled to the Glow to find proof of their beliefs. Only one managed to return, and as they died of radiation poisoning in their last breath, they said, There are no gods, only death. This final statement from one of the Glow expedition members caused the largest fracture in S. Lanter's young history. Those in the den believed in the gods with all their hearts, while the surface dwellers believed the dying S. Lanter as proof that gods don't exist. And that's essentially the summary for the intelligent raccoons. The crazy part is that there is so much more that I didn't mention. I could make an entire video itself. Things like plot hooks, quest ideas, notable locations, faction and city tie-ins, etc. Now, why were they cut? It seems like quite a bit of writing and development went into them, so why remove them from the game? Well, I'll let the game developers explain. When asked about the Burrows and Eslanter, Tim Kane said, As for the Burrows, this location was written by an early designer associated with the project. While it was well written, I feel like its content was not appropriate to our Fallout universe, mainly based on its style and feel in the game, and not on its artistic merit. So I did not approve its addition to the game and the Glow Holodisc is all that remains of any reference to that area. Chris Taylor had this to say, I always felt like it didn't fit in with the rest of the game. It was a finely designed area and would have helped the Glow, but it just didn't seem very Fallout-like. And lastly, Scott Campbell noted that, while Brian, meaning Brian Fryermuth, designer of many notable quests, characters, and the earliest version of the Fallout timeline, was off running and writing quests for our furry editions, the artist had a scope meeting about the number of characters in the game, we had designed more than they had time to actually build and animate, so a compromise was needed. Since the mutant animals were rare, required several sets of armor, and totally different animations, they were chopped. Poor Brian. He put so much love into those varmints. To summarize, it would seem like there are a couple reasons why the intelligent raccoons are not in our canon Fallout universe. One, they didn't feel like they belonged in Fallout. And two, they were already too many designed characters. Artists couldn't make and animate them all. And so, to the chopping block they went. That concludes our little three-part foray into Fallout's intelligent animals. Hope you enjoyed that. Pink Slime Defamation Of all the topics on this entire iceberg, I think this one might be the least related to the Fallout series, but it's interesting nonetheless. So in Fallout 4, there's this location called the Suffolk County Charter School. Prior to the Great War, Principal Jackie Hudson made an agreement with the federal government to implement their new experimental lunch program. The Nutritional Alternative Paste Program, or NAP, would see the replacement of all traditional cafeteria food with a pink food paste. Worst yet, all outside food would be confiscated, and disciplinary actions would be taken if caught eating something other than the food paste. Now, while the NAP program and food paste is likely a reference to the 1985 horror movie The Stuff, as one of the teachers even refers to it as The Stuff, 
it may also take some inspiration from real life. Pink slime, also known as lean, finely textured beef, is a meat byproduct used as a food additive to ground beef. Its purpose is to reduce the overall fat content in ground beef. It's made by taking beef trimmings and heating it up while it's in a centrifuge. This creates a fatless paste. This paste is then subject to ammonia gas or citric acid to kill bacteria. While the USDA approved the product for limited human consumption in 2001, other countries have banned it. In 2012, ABC News released an article which claimed that 70% of all ground beef at supermarkets contains pink slime. The article described pink slime as essentially scrap meat pieces compressed together and treated with an antibacterial agent. And while the contents of the article was disputed by the Food and Drug Administration, the US Department of Agriculture, and Beef Products Incorporated, that didn't stop consumers from critically questioning what was going into the food that they were buying. This led to campaigns from government officials and BPI, as well as markets removing any products that contained the additive. A change.org petition gained over 250,000 signatures requesting school lunches to ban the byproduct. This led to the USDA allowing schools to opt out of serving ground beef that had pink slime. Because of the commotion caused by the ABC article, Beef Products Incorporated decided to sue the news company for defamation. BPI claimed that ABC News made nearly 200 false, misleading, and defamatory statements repeated continuously during a month-long disinformation campaign. ABC News denied the claims, but the suit would move forward, going to trial on June 4, 2017. However, by the end of the month on June 28, ABC and BPI would reach a settlement. While the terms of the settlement were not disclosed, a Walt Disney earnings report indicated that the amount paid was at least $177 million. So maybe the tale of Follett's Pink Paste was inspired by not only an 80s horror classic, but also a bit from real life. Synth Hysteria Now, this is a big one, at least I think it's a big one, and it's a debate and discussion that is still being had to this day, and that is the topic of Synth Hysteria. You know, the idea that your loved ones have been replaced by synthetic human-like androids developed by a secret underground cabal that swears they mean well, but every time the people of the Commonwealth encounter them, only bad things happen. When it's put like that, it sounds quite like a conspiracy. Anyway, here's your spoiler alert. I'm gonna divulge every character that turns out to be a synth in the game. And I mean only the synths that are not outwardly obvious or introduce themselves as synths, by the way. I know the game has been out for a long while, but it just feels appropriate to give a spoiler for this, you know? Okay, let's get started. Mayor McDonough, synth. Gabe the Raider, synth. Jules from the self-admitted synth random encounter, synth. Magnolia, Synth. Roger Warwick, Synth. Sturges, Synth. Art from the Two Faces One Synth Random Encounter, Synth. Captain Avery, Synth. Brooks the Bait Shop Merchant, Synth. And that's it. Surprisingly, there aren't too many notable undercover synths. And thanks to many of these folks dropping a synth component, it's fairly easy to distinguish synth from human in-game. But there are three individuals in Fallout 4 that have sparked debates as to whether or not they're a synthetic being. I've made them their own little subheading. First up, the railroad's best heavy agent. Glory is a synth. Glory designation G781 was a synth rescued by the institution in 2280. Since then, she has become a valuable member of the railroad serving as a heavy agent. For a good 90% of the game, her synthhood is never questioned. It's only when her scripted death occurs during the main story quest, Precipice of War, and her body is checked, it's revealed that she does not, in fact, drop a synth component. This has caused many to question whether or not Glory was actually a synth, with a popular theory being that she was once a raider who joined the railroad as a way to atone. From what I gather, the quick rundown is that the word Glory can be found on the number 18F turbine at the Poseidon Energy Plant. The location where it is found is made up to look like a throne of sorts. And so the belief is that Glory was once the leader of the L&L Raider Gang at the Poseidon Energy Plant. To add to this, if Glory was indeed human, she wouldn't be the only one to claim that they are a synth. Phyllis Daly, founded the Egret Tours Marina, believes that she is an institute sleeper synth after she murdered her son while she was blacked out. So, three things add to the theory. One, the name at Poseidon. Two, no synth component. Three, she's not the only human to claim to be a synth. But there's also some counter evidence that goes against this theory, and proves that she is exactly what she says she is, a synth. So, of course Glory isn't the only synth to not drop a component. Both Roger Warwick and Eve Benet are both confirmed synths, yet do not drop a component on death. And the second thing is a bit more meta. 
So many game companies reuse assets for various things. It's a common thing to do to save time and money. Everyone does it, including Bethesda. The chalk writing at Poseidon is just a reused texture from the railroad. Exact same handwriting style and everything. It's just a reused texture. So I believe that instead of the word glory at Poseidon offering some backstory to the railroad agent, it's just a way to add some intrigue and more environmental storytelling to the location. At the end of the day though, believe what you want to believe. I'm on the side that Glory is a synth, but that's just me. Kasumi isn't a synth. Similar to Glory, Kasumi's true identity as a human or synth is just about the entire premise of the story hook for the Far Harbor DLC, and regardless of the chosen outcome for her quest, you as the player will never be able to confirm whether or not Kasumi was truly a synth. Despite Kasumi's claims to being a synth, there's no real proof to it. If Kasumi dies in the Brotherhood of Steel Rage, she won't drop a synth component. If the Institute reclaims the synths, Dr. Mosley won't confirm to you whether or not she was a synth. The only thing he can tell you is that they have no record of any synth named Kasumi. Again, it's just something that you'll have to come to a conclusion about by yourself. Soul Survivor is a synth. The last one is probably the most contested between the three. Is the Soul Survivor, the protagonist from Fallout 4? A synth? While there is some circumstantial evidence that could prove your character is not human, I think there's quite a bit more that proves the opposite. The sole survivor is a human. For the former, a big piece of evidence comes from the beginning of the game. Prior to getting the Pip-Boy in Vault 111, you are able to use VATS. This is odd. How can a human make use of the Vault Tech assisted targeting system without a Pip-Boy? Certainly a good piece of evidence. The second that I see mention is in regards to Dima's dialogue asking the Soul Survivor about their first memories. The Soul Survivor responds about remembering the day the bombs fell, being frozen in the vault, and being the only survivor. Now, people, Dima included, use this line to insinuate that the Soul Survivor is a synth, with Dima saying verbatim, we so easily accept what's presented to us as truth, don't we? Implying that it was an implanted memory. Well, the Soul Survivor during this dialogue isn't being the most truthful, or maybe they're just forgetful. Throughout the game, the Soul Survivor provides pre-war context to many things in the game. Baseball, Fenway Park, Silver Shroud Radio, your Veterans Hall speech, and more. It's not just one day's memory. Now, as for explaining away the VATS bit, yeah, that's a bit tough. As you don't play without a Pip-Boy for long, being able to use VATS without one just seems like an oversight. What can you do? Now, as for why I believe the Soul Survivor is a human, I think the biggest piece of evidence is the fact that the Soul Survivor can become the director of the Institute. To me, it would make absolutely zero sense for the Institute to allow a synth to run their faction, right? Like, it would be a complete conflict of interest, yeah? Anywho, as Dima says, ultimately you have to decide for yourself, and I think that's what you should do. Ugh, Qualtoth. It's wild that cosmic and eldritch entities just exist and followed, and everyone's just kinda chill with that. Don't get me wrong, I love the paranormal and occult elements of the game, but it's just hardly explicitly mentioned by anyone in the games. Of all the characters in Fallout, only a few are really tied to the occult. Obadiah Blackhall, his great-great-grandmother Constance, the Swamp Folk, the named ghouls at the Dunwich Borers, and Camp Counselor Nia are really the only characters that have a direct connection with the occult. Even crazier is the existence of Ugg Qualtoth, a mysterious eldritch deity that will likely never appear in Fallout. A shrine to the being can be found in the basement of the Dunwich Building in the capital wasteland. While not much is known about Ugg Qualtoth, it does appear to have some connection to Ghouls, the Krivbekni, and the Dunwich Borers LLC company. The Krivbekni was an ancient tome that was claimed to hide a dark power. Constance Blackhall used the book's mystical powers to prolong her life and start a cult. However, one day, the tome went missing and Constance would pass away shortly after. Some indeterminate amount of time later, in the Capital Wasteland, a scavenger acquired the mysterious book. Unable to pawn it off, he returned the book to where he found it, but it was already too late. Just being in possession of the book drove the scavenger mad. Again, some indeterminate amount of time later, the scavenger's son, a man named Jamie Palabras, now an adult, sought out what happened to his estranged father. Following his father's trail, Jamie wound up at the Dunwich building. There, he found the remains of his father, a feral ghoul corpse only identified by the same strange book next to him. A final holotape journal entry by Jamie reveals that, like his father, he had been driven mad. By the time the Lone Wanderer ventures into the Dunwich building themselves, Jamie has met a similar fate to his father's, a madman turned ghoul. Now, again, at some point, the Krivbekni was removed from the basement of the Dunwich building, and now can be found in the ritual chambers of Point Lookout. Constance's relative Obadiah wishes to have the book returned to its proper owner, 
the Black Hall family. In my humble opinion, I think it would be best if you do your best to appease the supernatural eldritch god. You know, get on his good side, I think. Vault Tech Phone Number Before we dive into this, I have to make a disclaimer. The phone number I'm about to present does not belong to Bethesda anymore. Do not call this number. Again, do not call this number. It does not belong to Bethesda. Okay, let's continue. At E3 2008, Bethesda released a trailer for their upcoming post-apocalyptic RPG called Fallout 3. The trailer features an in-universe commercial for Vault Tech Corporation. At the end, the host suggests that you call a number to reserve your spot in a vault and that operators are standing by. The number was 1-888-4 Vault Tech. If someone were to dial that number up, an automated voice would thank you for your call and tell you that there's a long line ahead of you before they'll get you in touch with a human operator. It's a quick 30 second automated message. Now, what's neato benito is that 7 years later when Fallout 4 launched, the same number could be found in-game. After creating a character, meander over to your calendar in your house and you'll find the exact same phone number. Again, if one were to dial the number at the time, the automated message would play. So it would seem that for at least 7 years Bethesda had this running easter egg that dated back to their first Fallout project in Fallout 3. Again, for the last time, do not dial the number. As far as I know, it doesn't belong to Bethesda anymore, and you won't get any Fallout related message or easter egg. Thank you. The Master Lives So the tale of Project V13, aka the Fallout MMO, is a long one and ties directly with how Fallout has come to be today. I won't be going over all the details of it as I actually want to save that for a super secret video, and this entry really isn't about the Fallout MMO. It's really about the Fallout MMO teaser trailer. On June 15, 2010, the Project V13 team released a teaser video as part of the launch for their Fallout Online website. It's not very long, only like 30 seconds, but it shows off quite a bit of neat things that are iconic to Fallout. Bottle caps, Nuka Cola, a Brahmin poster, Harold's name with a heart next to it, and the Vault Dweller's survival guide. But what's also quite plainly in view, etched into the wooden table, are the words the master lives. Now it should be known that for the purposes of canon, all promotional content, including teaser trailers, are non-canon. But that didn't stop people from questioning whether or not the master, the mutated amalgamation that was the villain of the first Fallout, would make a return to the franchise. As the first iteration of V13 would be officially cancelled on December 20th, 2012 for another project by the same name, we will never really know for sure if the master does indeed live. I mean, if we're being real though, it's a pretty gnarly death animation. But you never know, maybe he backed up his data onto a different disc or something. Edgar Blackburn We know that exposure to the forced evolutionary virus tends to turn people into green or orange super mutants. But what's absolutely wild is that a former West Tech scientist willingly exposed themselves to a variant of FEV and turned themselves into not only a super mutant, but a super mutant behemoth. That is wild. Dr. Edgar Blackburn was a research scientist working at West Tech prior to the Great War. Fortunately for him, and unfortunately for many, he managed to survive the nuclear apocalypse. He would continue his research studying various diseases and ailments that plagued the wastelanders of Appalachia. This brought him to his experiments with the forced evolutionary virus. Believing that it could be modified to help humanity thrive, Blackburn would recruit some other West Tech colleagues who also managed to survive total nuclear annihilation. And so, in the name of science and doing deeds for the greater good, he and his team would hire a mercenary group called the Hellcat Company to kidnap wastelanders and subject them to harsh, and many times lethal, experiments. To them, this loss of life was worth it if they could somehow make FEV an immunity agent. But these missing people didn't go unnoticed, and with a rise in supermune attacks as of late, the newly established Brotherhood First Expeditionary Force would start an investigation. After following several leads and discovering that Blackburn was behind the disappearances, the Vault Dweller and Scribe Valdez would find Blackburn in the Overseer's office of Vault 96, where he would peacefully surrender. However, Blackburn reveals that he was not working alone, and so he is escorted to the West Tech Research Facility where the Brotherhood would attempt to halt all work on the FEV. Blackbird managed to trick the Brotherhood, regroup with his peers, and in a final show of resistance, injected himself with their new FEV strain. The strain turned him into a unique super mutant behemoth, which I believe is the first documented case of someone going from human to behemoth with no intermediate step. Absolutely wild. Fallout TV Town You ever see WandaVision, or that It's a Good Life Twilight Zone episode, or just any 50s or 60s television shows? Well, very early in the development of Fallout 2, 
well before the team had come up with the plot for the game. They were, as one does, brainstorming ideas for the game's story. You know, we're making a sequel to Fallout, what is it going to be about? One of the earliest rough drafts for the game's story revolved around a town that was created by an advanced AI. In the Fallout 2 official Strategies and Secrets guidebook, at the very end, in the book's appendix, it goes over the process of making a game, specifically a Fallout game. In the second section titled The Doodling in Your Head Stage, Matt Norton, the author and one of the lead designers and directors of Fallout 2, revealed some rough brainstorm ideas about what Fallout 2's story could have been, and that was something we know as TV Town. Norton writes, Our first story centered around an intelligent computer that had created an entire town of androids based upon 50s and 60s television shows. This TV town was a point of contention for the surrounding areas, who all wanted a piece of the town's technology for themselves. The ending to this first draft even included the PC going into space at the end. How about that? An entire town where its residents are androids that are based on famous television characters. While the current plot of Fallout 2 is great and introduces several fan-favorite factions, characters, and storylines, I will admit that the TV town is one of those what-could've-been moments. Here's hoping for something similar to it in a future game. I think that would be really cool. Fallout 1 Time Limit Fallout 1 has a time limit. Well, actually, it has multiple time limits. The first one, which is 150 days, is unsurprisingly the estimated time the Vault Dweller has before Vault 13's current water chip and water supply will run dry, leaving its dwellers perpetually parched. The time limit can be extended by an additional 100 days if the Vault Dweller gets the hub to send water caravans to Vault 13. But there's also a second, lesser known time limit on the first Fallout. As it turns out, there is a bigger threat to the Vault 13 population than just the lack of water. A mutant known as the Master has created a super mutant army and plans to use it to raid vaults, make more mutants using the forced evolutionary virus, and reform the rest of humanity by turning everyone into super mutants. So this is where the second time limit comes in. Once a new water chip is sourced, the Vault Dweller is then tasked with stopping the super mutant threat. If this, and finding a new water chip is not done within 500 days of the game start, or 400 if the location of Vault 13 was revealed to the hub merchants, then the Super Mutant Army discovers the location of Vault 13 and a cutscene plays showing the Super Mutants overrunning the vault. However, when version 1.1 of Fallout was released on November 13th, 1997, the 500 day time limit was just about fully removed from the game, replacing it with a 13 year in-game time limit instead making the wasteland yours to discover without having to worry about an impending mutant invasion. Fallout 2 Time Limit Now this one is definitely more obscure. While the main quest demands some urgency to complete, as the village of Arroyo is struggling, the game doesn't have an explicit time limit. Unlike Fallout 1, there is no timer counting down to the end of days, no 150 day counter until the tribe starves, no 500 day timer for a mutant invasion. However, the in-game clock still has a hard cap. Similar to Fallout 1.1, if you run around the wasteland for several real-life days until 13 years have passed in-game, an ending screen will appear with some text reading the end. No crazy cutscene, no ending narration, just the end. Game over, man. It's game over. Jet is Jankum. This one is not really a theory, or a conspiracy, or really any double meaning. It's just a lore entry. An unhinged lore entry to be exact. Jet is Jankum. If you know what Jankum is already, then you already know why it makes this list. If you've never heard of Jankum before, well, this is a bit of a doozy. In Fallout, Jet is a chem commonly administered through an inhaler. While some version of it existed and was available pre-war, by the mid-2200s, one evil, sleazy teen scientist came up with his own modified variant of the chem. By capturing the fumes of tons of Brahmin feces, Myron had created an inhaled hallucinogen fit for sale, and thus Myron's jet was created. Sounds like a load of crap, right? Well, it is actually. It's a load of Brahmin crap. Literally. Essentially, the people of New Reno were getting high off the smell of Brahmin dung. Of course, there's a bit more to it, but that's the gist. In the real world, a similar sort of method was used by Zambian youth in the mid-1990s to get high. Except instead of getting high off the fumes of mutated cow feces, they used their own feces instead. This homemade drug was known as Jankum. It was made by scraping the sewage off of exposed drainage pipes and storing it for a week or so until it gave off intoxicating fumes. There you go, a bit of fallout lore and a bit of real life lore. Both equally unhinged I might add. Courier Cut Wedding Here's a quick one that wasn't on the original iceberg. 
Early into the development for New Vegas companion Rose of Sharon Cassidy, there were some talks about having a shotgun wedding with the courier. While not much is known about it, and this likely never got past the brainstorming stage of development, the idea was that at some point in the game, both the player character and Cass would get drunk, and during their stupor, get married. The king would serve as the officiant, and an Elvis song would play during the proceedings. Again, not much is known about it outside of what Josh Sawyer told PC Gamer in a 2015 interview. Strangely enough though, this wouldn't have been the first time a Fallout protagonist has gotten married. And that concludes Tier 3 of the Unhinged Fallout Iceberg, and marks the halfway point. Again, if there's anything that you think belongs here that I've yet to talk about, let me know, and I'll see if I can squeeze it into something in the later tiers, or maybe make a bonus fan-created tier. That would be neat. Also, let me know if there's anything from any of the tiers thus far that you want me to go deeper in depth with for its own separate video. Other than that, that's all from me today, folks. If you liked the video, be sure to share and subscribe. Have a good rest of your day. Cheers. In short, brains, a heart, and courage. Spine. I think there was a story once where a band of murderous thugs sought these things. They had them all the time in the story. Didn't stop them from murdering to get them. And it won't stop the think tank either.